Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Hello. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, gives me great pleasure to introduce Victor today. Uh, Victor got his PhD from UMass Amherst, and he's currently a principal researcher and head of the mobility and networking research group at Microsoft Research Redmond. He's well known for several pieces of seminal work, uh, including radar, where Wi-Fi is used for indoor localization rather than communication. Uh, his work on Wi-Fi, mesh networking, and of course, white space networking that he's going to talk about today. Uh, so Victor is a fellow of the IEEE and ACM and has won numerous awards, including ACM SIG Mobile's highest award, which is its Lifetime Achievement Award for outstanding contributions to wireless research. And if you have not had a chance to take a look, uh, he has an excellent award talk titled Me and My Research. Uh, and I'm assuming it's on the web, and where he talks about what it takes to sort of take good research and make it great and have an impact on the world, right? And he touches on characteristics like being courageous when others think your idea is foolish and perseverance where you keep plugging away on your idea until it's real and, you know, bulletproof. And I think we saw some of that, for example, in Sachin's talk the first day, taking idea like full duplex, which maybe people would have laughed at, and then making it real over many, many iterations, like several years of work. So without further ado, Please join me in welcoming Victor Ball. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, it's strange, I when I get an award like a Lifetime Teaching Merit Award, I feel like I don't think I'm done yet. <laughs> but I feel like I'm supposed to be done because you usually get when you have a lot of white hair, you're kind of like sitting back and reflecting and. So, and it's true, actually, I, I don't know if you know, I'm like the youngest guy in the whole, everybody's like white hair, so I, I feel a little embarrassed about it, but nevertheless, I'll take it. <laughs> All right, uh, thank you very much for having me here. I think uh, I'm going to entertain you today, okay? So, uh, you, uh, Ram talked about, um, about making things real and uh, uh, persevering, which is true. Uh, what I'm going to present today um, is is a topic. Uh, first, let me uh, do. Any of you know about white space networking? All right, that's pretty good. You, of course, know. You don't have to raise your hand. This is Kun. He actually works on it uh, full time for the last six years, so he's raising his hand. Anyway, it doesn't matter. So uh, uh, good. Uh, some of you know. That's great. So for the for for those of you, it'll be you can sit back, and relax, and for those of you who. Don't know. I'm gonna. I have two hours. We'll give it a break. We'll have a break after about an hour. I've tried to divide it up into two talks. Uh, one talk is giving you the history of how we started, why this is important, uh, what's happening, where we are. So, and then the next uh, talk will be more technical and get into some of the technical issues that one needs to solve and we have solved and where we are. And so, give you some sense of the kinds of problems that we need to deal with. Now. Uh, Making it real, I think this is the sort of the important thing. So to me, uh, this is, uh, I, like to, I don't like to work on incremental things. So I don't like to work on uh, uh, improvements of, you know, small thing here. Not to say that is not an important thing. I think that's really important and real engineering gets it done that way. Research is all about, you know, you go and keep doing the problem, keep drilling, keep drilling till you can't drill anymore and you sort of think that you've got the best solution. But my style is a little different than that. I, I tend to sort of try to do uh, what I perceive as new things and new big areas that are going to open up new paths. So this is one of those areas, and I started doing working on this uh, in 2003, actually, for quite a while. And um, it's still not there, but I believe this is uh, very big. But like anything else, there is a risk that will go away, and you will understand what the risk is once I'm done. So at the end of this, you can talk. So feel free to interrupt me. Feel free to ask questions. And um, we'll make it interactive, we'll make it exciting and enjoyable. Um, it's not about learning right now everything that I tell you, but it's about piquing your interest enough that you go back and you find the right papers, you read those papers, and then you start drilling and finding your own thing. All right? Okay. With that, this is an obligatory slide. I need to put it in just to press, uh, set the context and for you to go. But essentially, um, 
some of these bullets are pretty straightforward. You've already probably had many speakers talk about this, but uh, you know, while it's just amazingly amazing amount of growth, this is where real action is for the long time. And now data centers, but I think data centers is sort of you know, we will solve that problem. Wireless is not a problem that we can actually solve really easily. So it's growing. Uh, there is a lot of user being uh, uh, data that has been generated, and there are lots of marketing uh, graphs which show you, like from Cisco, for example, which show you how much usage is going up, uh, how much pressure there is on these networks. Now, I have to tell you that I'm very disappointed by the networks here. Okay, I I've been I have done some measurements. Um, while I'm here, I've been only here one day, and I just find it uh, pathetic, very, very bad. So for, the, for those of you who are not going to go to grad school or not going to go to the U.S., which is great, you stay here, you must keep this in mind that we are way behind. This is very, very bad, what is happening. But there is no reason. There is no actual technical reason for it to be so bad as it is here. However, my, uh, uh, from my vantage point, I'm just going to tell you how, because I live in the U.S., how things are there. And what, what you need to do as you, you know, uh, get into your uh, careers and all is to leapfrog, and you can, but uh, keep all this in mind. So massive amount of consumption of data um, and uh, lots and lots of new apps, right? Even in my own lab in Redmond, the kinds of applications that uh, researchers are building, they can be sustained over the wireless networks. But they are great at They actually add to your productivity. They make you much more efficient. They make you do even bigger things, more important things. But you can't actually run them, and you will not be able to run them in India, for example, at all, because the networks will not sustain. Just to say we do it over Wi-Fi is not good enough, right? Because you're moving around all the time. Wi-Fi is not there everywhere. Latency LTE is touted as the next big thing. That's great. It's coming all over the US. But latency is still very 70 to 100 milliseconds. And this latency is a killer. It can't. Uh, there are many apps you can't do. Um, uh, then uh, you know you have a lot of concern about bandwidth, and then, um, uh, but but you know this last bullet is true. The more connectivity you have, the more bandwidth you have, the more prosperity. But actually, believe it or not, you can have because you can do more than things. All right. <clears throat> now, in the U.S., you see, often see um, uh, reports like this. This is slightly old slide, but it's true. So everybody sort of realizes this, and they know that they're hurling, uh, hurling towards a problem. So there's a spectrum crisis, is what they call it. So when you look at these, um, these headlines, you sort of see all this stuff, right? You see um, uh, there is a spectrum crisis. There is going to be a problem in terms of how much bandwidth. Okay, in India, actually, I think you already have it, because it's not being utilized very well. So this is, this is fair and square in the middle of, the, uh, of every debate, not just in technology, not in just technical fields, but also in the policy, regulatory field, governments, everywhere else. Okay, now you say, okay, what do I do? You look at this, uh, fine, let's find some spectrum. But then you go around, this is the US chart, and some of you may be familiar with it, but if you're not, what this is showing is, this shows how the spectrum, a finite resource, is allocated in the world, right? And all these colors and things, they are just basically different allocations to different parties, right? They're allocated for defense, which NTIA, there's a body there, NTIA control. And then the FCC controls all the commercial stuff. They, they handle to all kinds of things, medicals, uh, uh, public security, whatever. Same thing has happened in Brazil, UK, Canada. The one, actually, the finding a chart for India has been tremendously difficult. I don't know if you've ever found it or not. If you do, please share it with me. I obviously knew I was going to give a talk here, and I couldn't find one. <laughs> so it was very difficult even to find a chart like that. But the interesting thing here is that this was done many, many decades ago. Right, many decades ago, they had decided that the best way to allocate it, we will give it to TV broadcasters, or we will give it to uh, for medical supplies, or we'll give it to intervehicle communications, or whatever. And so this was all the static application. Now you look at it and you say, well, uh, Wi-Fi has become very big, cellular has become very big. We need more data, more bandwidth. But you don't know where to give it because it's all given away. So you've got a crisis. That's where the crisis comes from. It's true everywhere. All over the world, it's the same thing, because everybody sort of evolved in the same direction. I bet you in India, it's sort of the same thing as well. OK, so what can we do? All right. So one is thick, uh, make the pipes thicker, make more bandwidth. But I already showed you that's a problem. Next is, you know, you're all, a lot of you are in double E, uh, communication theory, all that kind of good stuff. And you can say, well, let's kind of squeeze more bits out of the hertz, right? But I'll submit to you that this actually has been done quite a bit. We already are at the limit of that. All right, Turbo Coach will actually get you pretty much there. We're limited by the noise floor. 
Okay, if you've got, you can't do more than what the channel provides you. So even though you might do more and more tricks like MIMOs or you know other other interesting coding techniques, you're not going to be able to extract the amount of um, bits that we want to go from every hertz. In this, yeah. So I think uh, this this is uh, I don't know what they say here, but essentially the way to think about this is um, there are frequencies. Now I'm trying to think like uh, the frequencies. How do you? Yeah, that's right. So the thickness as well as the amount, the the the, the bands, zero to whatever versus how thick they are. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Um, all right. So I talked about this. Now um, another idea is that you reduce the cell size, right? You reduce the cell size because the smaller cell size, that's a network architecture trick. You have more capacity. So uh, so theoretically, you can have infinite capacity or close to infinite capacity because you can just reduce the cell size to be so small, and then you just present uh, the data there, and then you kind of repeat it. But that's a serious problem because imagine how much management headache it is, how much control traffic you have to sort of center around to manage it. I mean, so this is always the case, right? Theory is just practical. Uh, people who are uh, in theory sort of think like uh, these guys are practical. They're just ingenious. They're not researchers. That's actually wrong. That's not true. <laughs> but you have to be very pragmatic in designing these systems. So you have to innovate on both sides. And then uh, another idea is to sort of say, well, uh, maybe we can have people who own the spectrum, you know, uh, give it away. Or you know can sell the spectrum. So if I owe something, or FCC has given me, or NTIA, or somebody else has given, I have the spectrum. I can give it back, and then and some create a commercial market out of that. We can talk a little bit more about it later. And then the other one, the more technical solution is that, hey, if somebody's not using it, let's use it. Okay, that's opportunistic. It's like the spectrum is there. I'm looking at it. There's nobody using it. I'll use it. And if you want to use it, I'll get out of the way. Right? If you do that, then that possibility becomes quite quite good. So now, uh, just let's uh, step back for a second for you to appreciate how this all came about. So I, my first exposure to a lot of these issues started in 2003, okay? Now, it was already clear in the 11 years ago, or sorry, yeah, just 11 years ago, that you know, we wanted more. We didn't really at the time realize how much more, but we wanted more. So everybody was aware of it. Um, then the question at that time was, and it still is, is whether it should be licensed or unlicensed. So um, cellular is licensed, Wi-Fi is unlicensed, right? And um, quick question, how many of you think, if you were, let's say, the chairman of one of the regulatory bodies, and you had a certain amount of uh, uh, spectrum, what would you do? Would you give it, make it licensed? License would mean that uh, certain, you know, some party will come and say, hey, I'll give you so much money, so many crores, so many billion dollars, whatever. You give me the spectrum, and then I will make it available for the public. Right? That's license use. Or uh, somebody say, well, we're not going to give you money, but look at all the good. After all, this is a national resource. This is not a resource to be made money. And that person says, well, you know, look at Wi-Fi. Look how successful it is. So the question I pose to you, for those of you who are not sleeping, <laughs> there's actually one of you who's sleeping here who just got off. <laughs> That's a joke. I, I actually always do that. So <laughs> tell me what, whether you would make it. Uh, so the people who think that a certain amount of spectrum should go to for license use. Just raise your hands. Okay, and unlicensed. Okay, the unlicensed users have it now. Let me uh, ask the question to the licensed users. One of you who raised your hand. Why do you think it should be licensed? I'm just kind of curious why. Who you? One of you raised your hands, right? I forget who. Who's who is you there? Like who who is you? Like you is the person who buys it, or you is the government, or who? The minister. <laughs> <laughs> Haven't they already done that? <laughs> anyway, okay. That is the case for license spectrum uh -huh. because I think it allows for efficient usage. Uh, people make money out of it. I see. So they will, there is to some extent orchestration that's possible that makes the spectrum efficient. Unlicensed ones. I think one needs to strike a balance. That is my opinion. Perhaps the uh, uh, 
fraction of unlicensed and licensed must change. You may need more unlicensed mm -hmm. uh, than the amount of license that can But right now you're hedging now. I'm hedging. Yes, yeah. one, one, I think we need both solutions. Uh, somebody who said unlicensed, can you actually refute that argument? His argument is that you can get more efficiency out of the system because, I mean, I'm going to rephrase some of the things he said, but essentially he said, if you give me license, you know, I've already spent a lot of money on it because I'll buy it, so somebody's going to, government is going to make money, and that government, hopefully, in theory, should go to the tax, uh, go back to the tax uh, uh, population, the people who pay the taxes, all the population, and it's just got better, better use of the spectrum. So that's fundamentally his argument. Anybody else who said unlicensed, can you? Yeah. Giving away that resource to somebody, yeah. and then you switch to another user, yeah. and that is like more efficient. And yeah. Can't that happen in the US also? Yes, it can. Hold that thought. We will go back to that. That's a good, good point. Uh, spectrum is a natural resource like water. Yeah. And yeah, so it should be freely given. Maybe some taxes should be paid. Like that. Clean water is supplied. That's absolutely a, a very, very uh, strong and compelling argument because. Uh, what's been said is that no matter what you do, if somebody buys it, they are buying it for profit, which is what you're saying. They're buying it. And so if you think, if you think of this as a natural resource or, or utility, water, everybody should get water whether they, can, uh, you know, uh, whether they can afford it or not. Similarly, if you think of information as just the natural thing that everybody must have uh, to sort of uh, move forward, then it should be free. And it would never be free if you actually sell it. So that's kind of what the argument is. And and the other thing is that it is not clear. I have one more idea with uh, with what he said. Yeah. Okay. Instead of giving the uh, spectrum license to the users for the whole time, yeah. you can give how much time they will uh, use the spectrum. You yeah. can charge for that every time. Yeah. Whenever a user charges, then it will be very easy. So yeah. So you're you're talking about some sort of a, a so mid mid ground between the two. Yeah. Oh, nobody? Okay. So let me just go on. Uh, just keep these points in mind. This is actually uh, take these arguments to the extreme, which is that you actually have uh, people arguing on both sides. And in fact, in fact, this individual who I bet you most of you don't know. If you know it, just raise your hands and I'll be very surprised and I'll take you out for lunch. <laughs> See? I know. That's okay. I didn't know him either for a long time. He got a Nobel Prize. He got the Nobel Prize for arguing that the way uh, spectrum was allocated uh, was uh, by the FCC and all was all, all bad. It was a bad way to, and that was not the best way, both from economic sense, which is what you're saying, as well as, and he was an economist, so he wasn't actually technical from economic sense. It didn't make sense for the way it was allocated and the way it was uh, spread out. So um, I'll come back to all these discussions, and hopefully by the end you will have a much stronger opinion either way. Okay, and either is fine actually. So uh, going back to my uh, the history of all this stuff. So in uh, uh, around 2003, uh, there was a, a event held in Stanford University. I was invited to this event, and there were the who's who at the time of people who were leading policy thinkers. Now these guys are not in technical fields; they are lawyers, and they're just uh, they belong to think tanks, right? So, for example. Uh, uh, Leslie uh, Lessig is still very active and a very smart man and actually writes very well. So if you get a chance, you should read about him. And really, the, the question was, is it a property or is it commons? So uh, uh, what is your name? Yeah. Yeah. yeah so I was just going to say, uh, as he suggested, so he talked about the commons. And then as, uh, as he suggested, you talked about the property. So there was a debate in 2003 and has been forever about the properties in the commons. Now. In order to get, and the lesson number one, from what, this is from my talk in, uh, when I gave, when I won the award. So lesson number one here is that if you want to be part of this talk, you want to be part of it, you want the seat on the table, bring a proposal to it. You can't just sort of just say, I want to be there, because everybody wants to be there. <laughs> you can read about it. But if you actually have something important and intelligent to say, bring a proposal on the table. And I did. I brought a proposal on the table to that particular workshop, and I talked about spectrum etiquettes. At the time, uh, uh, now it's in, in retrospect, it seems very naive, but at the time, it sort of seems like, hey, let's all be good. You know, let's all be very nice and just do the right thing and have an etiquette, just that like you have manners. Right? You, you don't speak when somebody else is speaking. That's a manner. Similarly, in spectrum, why don't we have uh, manners like that? 
And actually, it's a, uh, uh, to just to pat myself on the back, it actually is well thought out paper. It's a well thought out paper because I, I was writing this with the intention that in all these regulatory bodies should not mandate how innovation should happen. It should, they didn't want to mandate, for example, what kind of MAC protocol you have, what kind of channel access you have, what kind of coding you have. But what they can do is they say, okay, this is how you can use it, this is the power numbers and all that stuff, right? So it's well thought out there, but it's all wrong. Because nobody actually thinks about etiquette. This is what I've discovered over many, many years, because there's a lot of money involved, lots of other stuff is involved. And so it's all good, but it's all theory. Now, <clears throat> so, so, but anyway, it got me there, got me a lot of exposure to a lot of these things. And then life kept moving on. And then I we sort of, over a period of time, now I'm just moving uh, way further, I had some interns. Both are from interns in different time. I forget now when this was done. This was done many, several years ago. This was done just recently. What this shows is it's just looking at the spectrum. And what you see is that you see all these gaps. Like, for example, um, think of this as amplitude. Think of this as spectrum or, or, or frequencies. And you see that there are all these gaps in the sense that, are, that it's not being used. Right? It's empty. And then, so this is a more uh, recent picture. This is uh, Lishin, Lishin Shi. Uh, he's Dina Katabi student at MIT. He was interning with me. And uh, this is one of the blocks taken from that FCC picture that I showed you. And this is the occupancy graph. And you can see it's all empty. So what it shows you is a lot of frequency has been given away, but people are not using it, right? They're not using it. So we call them white spaces. By the way, just as a funny thing, uh, a lot of people ask me, what the hell do you call it white? Why don't you call it black? Or why don't you brown? <laughs> I mean, this kind of sensitivity you have to deal with, but let's not worry. It's called white spaces. Okay. So, so then, you know, so I was, we were not the only ones observing this. Many other people were observing it, and there was lots of talk that was happening. Others have done other, some other studies. And so this idea of dynamic spectrum access became pretty big, right? The idea was, hey, let's just use this. It's empty. Why don't we just use it for data connectivity? Why are we just uh, wasting it, right? But the problem is, stock is cheap, and you will always find this, right? You'll always find people who can, who will debate, who will have, who will sound very smart, who will say a lot of things, but they've never built a thing in their life, okay? And they have never actually sort of, uh, they don't step up to do the thing, right thing. Like, don't, don't. I mean, somebody has to prove that this thing can actually work, all right? So that was sort of the challenge that we were facing, which was that. Nothing will move forward by just talking, talking. You have to actually build it to prove it. And that's what we do as engineers. We, we build things. OK, so now we keep moving. So what is opportunistic access? So if you look at this frequency graph, frequency versus power graph, you say these are, let's say, primary users. So PU stands for primary users. So you say, well, here's a gap. Let me just sense it. I'll sense the channel. I'll find a gap, and I'll start operating here. Well, now somebody, the prime, another primary user comes in. Primary user is the user who owns that spectrum. Okay, so let's say um, these are the owners of the spectrum. This guy is unlicensed, and he just sort of shows up. And then the owner shows up and starts using it. So this guy has to immediately sense that, see that the owner is not there, and move to a different place, right? Immediately move and continue operating. Now, uh, similarly, you will notice that uh, the, the channel width here and the channel width here is different. The amplitudes are different here. So you have to be, if you're going to be like this, which is just sense something and then use it, you have to be very flexible. You have to be flexible in the bandwidth, and you have to be flexible in the amplitude as well. So you sense it, you transmit in the white spaces, you detect if a primary user shows up, you move to a white space, and you adapt to your bandwidth. Okay, from a technical perspective, that's what you have to build. Now, where we're going with all this stuff is, really, if you think like idly in the world, if we could build a system like that, right? If we could technically build a system, then we don't need any of this stuff, right? We just need this. Everything becomes shared. We don't need any allocation. What we do is we need allocation, but we need sort of like say, here's the primary user, and we can build a system like that, which should always work. That means the primary user will never suffer, which is really what you want. And then you can go there. Now, once you go there, I would submit that you have infinite capacity. You have more capacity than you can ever have to deal with, right? So does, so. Uh, the old way does not exploit the time, space, frequency, degrees of freedom. DSA actually does and provides you unlimited gag. So that's where we want to go. Now, so what is TV white space? So I just talked about white spaces so far. So it turns out that in 1996, uh, the US Congress had authorized the distribution of some additional channels to televisions to start transmitting digitally. So 
they did not they did not take the analog ones away but they kept gave them the digital ones because they they wanted to move in this you know edge tv generation was coming more resolution all the good stuff all the digital technology were to be used but they couldn't take the analog away because there were millions of people still using these big antennas on the rooftops when I, uh, uh, to get the signals and so they couldn't but they said that in 2009 okay so that's approximately what is it like four um, yeah 13 years later they're going to completely move switch over to digital to give 13 years to switch over but the interesting thing was when you switch over the rule of thumb is that you use one third when you do digital you use about one third the bandwidth to transmit the same information that you would use in the analog so a whole lot of spectrum opened up this was now suddenly wow <laughs> great we have spectrum <clears throat> and this was you know this was going on in parallel right now turns out the tv spectrum is amazing right it's actually some people think of it as a beachfront property beautiful beach beautiful why is it amazing because it can actually provide you great propagation tvs had to tv signals had to propagate through uh, ceilings and rooms and all the other stuff and kind of get to your tv boxes which were like in your, in your homes and you didn't have so many tv based stations you had few and they were broadcasting yes and great power but nevertheless had this thing so it was considered a beachfront property and a lot of the proponents started to say well you know what you can actually build uh, for rural areas now you don't need the cell guys to show up if you give us this spectrum we can build it up inside enterprises public safety all these different things you could do that was that was sort of the thing and there were a lot of articles on it so what happened is so when they opened up so this is the band again from zero to uh, a 900 megahertz that i show you the things to focus in on the uh, in the yellow uh, color and the red so this was the bands that were opened up when the when the transition happened and out of these bands the government immediately sold these ones okay so they sold it and when you say lte at least in the united states so everything i'm talking about is the us now uh, for India, there's pretty similar things, and we can actually talk about that in discussion later. Um, uh, but, but so everything I'm giving you uh, is what is happening in the U.S. And but you can see draw parallels anywhere in the world. It's not just the U.S. So the AT&T and the Verizon, these are the big telcos there. They bought it and started doing LTE. These ones were left open. Now, of course, the properties were uh, for these were uh, let's say unlicensed. You can get long range, and you can get very deep penetration. Now, uh, just I, mean, I don't have too many equations, but if you sort of say, let's let's think about like what the propagation looks like. So, do a very simple modeling, right? This is the received power, transmit power, free space loss, a loss uh, loss at the transmitter and loss at the receiver. That gives you uh, uh, the, what the power you get at the receiver. And then free space loss is a uh, is a function of frequency and distance. So this is F here. This is D. That's the distance between the transmitter and receiver. This is the gain of the transmitter. This is the gain of the receiver, right, on the, on the two antennas. So if you, you can see that the receive power is a function of the frequency. Now, if you plug all this uh, good stuff in, you, it gets you, if you, for the same power budget, and power budget means, in some sense, think of it as, as your, uh, the, the wireless NIC that sits here. It works on some power budget, right? It has to receive a signal over a certain threshold. Only then it can decode it. So for the same sort of power budget, if you do the calculation, it's about four times. This, these frequencies give you four times the propagation that, they would, that would, you would get for Wi-Fi. Let's look at it from a real world perspective. This is where I actually live. This is where Microsoft headquarters is. It's actually in Redmond. Well, Redmond is not there, but it's very close to Bellevue, which is where I live. So Bellevue and Sammamish, these are, these are the uh, places around where we live. So if you look at this, these reds are the good coverage areas the blues are bad coverage and then green is sort of like in the middle indoor coverage so you can just focus on the reds and through i'm going to switch this shot real quickly and show you this it's the same map with different red coverages and of the different so oops so uh which is which looks better first or second second looks better i don't know if you noticed the first one has 10 sites the second one has three sites right that's a pretty big deal. So the 10 sites one is at 2,600 megahertz. So that's approximately 2.4 gigahertz. That's where the Wi-Fi works, right? And the three sites one is at a 700, which is where the TV spaces are. So that's why this is beachfront property. For three, uh, with three access points, you can actually touch a lot more people. So cost-wise, it's great. It's just great. Okay.
So we wanted to see for real if this is actually real, theory aside, let's do the practical thing. So we had uh, several years ago, we built a system, and uh, this is a garage, parking garage, it's showing a picture of an antenna and some radios, and this is sort of plotting all the places that the coverage was done. So what we found is that the range is approximately five times the Wi-Fi. So theory was being conservative. This is actually good. We like that. So for a Wi-Fi was the range. Now, this is a little bit more uh, cleaner graph. This was done more recently. Actually, it was done in 2008 or 9, I forget. But what this shows is there is a base station right there. And then what the white is is a shuttle driving around the campus, not, not unlike this campus. And we are measuring the signal strength. So this is distance from the base station. And this is the RSSI value that's coming. And so you have uh, <coughs> the, uh, the, 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 uh, the one is in VHS, one is in UHF. And what you see is, in DBM, you see that even at 1.2 um, is this my kilometers, right, you still have good signal. Now, it turned out that this was a very, very uh, suboptimal piece of hardware we had. So uh, when people ask me what is the range, I give them a, a sort of a rule of thumb of about one mile, even more. So 1.6 kilometers is the range. So 1.6 kilometers. Now, if you know Wi-Fi, can anybody tell me what is the range of Wi-Fi? Who said 200? 200. That's actually being optimistic. It's not really. I mean, that's what they actually actually say 300, but really it isn't. It's actually less, especially in these buildings and things. It's, it's about 100. I, I rule of thumb is about 100, 150 meters. I will. I will touch on it. Yeah. The point being made is um, uh, smaller cell size, more capacity. I'll touch on it, but I'll just give a short answer right now. Everything that you can do Wi-Fi, you can do here. <laughs> so if you, if, you, if you think that I'm getting more spatial use in Wi-Fi, there's nothing stopping you from getting more spatial use in here. You just make the cell size smaller as well. But what, what the, the other way around Wi-Fi doesn't give you, right? You say, I don't have in rural coverage, for example. If you want to create a net mesh network or you want to create, you can't actually do that without, the, without uh, having the propagation property. Yeah, reduce your transmission. Actually, yeah, reduce, and reduce it quite a bit because right now we're transmitting at the same levels at, at Wi-Fi. Yeah. So, and, and this is a little pictorial showing that uh, I've already said something to you that the transmission inside, indoors, is pretty damn good too. Right? It actually penetrates a lot better than Wi-Fi. In fact, uh, um, over a break, somebody asked somebody if they care to ask me, you can ask me why didn't mesh networking succeed. I actually spent a considerable amount of my life doing mesh networking, and then I walked away from it. Uh, not actually, I didn't walk away from it because of uh, some uh, technical reason, but it was because the objectives that I set out for ourselves, we achieved those objectives and move on. But as I look back, uh, I can tell you why I think it failed. And part of the reason it failed was because propagation was terrible and it was very costly. And this one doesn't have that issues. So you might actually want to consider uh, uh, mesh network uh, again. So, uh, so now the question is, uh, how do we find if the spectrum is uh, uh, available, right? So um, <clears throat> uh, the one thing I didn't tell you yet, which I should, that when the spectrum opened up, it wasn't like uh, it was clean. Okay, there were still TV signals that were going, and there was a lot of PR and things around that we can't leave because there are still millions of people depending on analog signals and. You know, like you, if you if you take if you uh, force doing data connectivity, they will all lose it. And there were like paper, in lots of newspapers, there were articles written about it, like unhappy grandmother who's watching TV and suddenly it all gets messed up. And there were advertisements and all. So, so the government was hedging because government is inherently political and they need votes and they're not going to figure. You know, so what they had said was that let's think about this as a primary user, secondary user. Well, we know that analog TV will not be there, so most people can use it. But sometimes it might be there. And if it is there, you must sense it. If it's there, then don't transmit. That's what they said, OK? So then that means that we have to sense it. Now, uh, what has happened, and I'm going to skip this part, is that over the many years uh, as researchers and engineers, we went down the path of trying to build sensing systems, right? We looked at energy detection. I mean, so, if a, if a signal energy was over a certain threshold, then maybe it was there was a signal there. We tried to do feature extraction, to do pattern matching to see if there are more uh, what kind of signals there is. But really, nobody could conclusively show that we knew how to do sensing. That we can, without a doubt, always uh, sense correctly, and without a doubt, always get it done. And there was a lot of pressure, and nobody could wait 
Okay. So the thing was, and we had to sort of take the uh, take the thing that at this point, technology is not there. We are not ready to be able to build systems that can really sense well. All right. So is there another way to do this, right? And so somebody said, yeah, of course there is. I mean, this is our paper. I'm not saying that we were the ones, but generally we did have a lot of influence. By the way, uh, uh, we introduced us Victor, but my name is Paranavir. There's a history with that too, I can talk. But anyway, so uh, the, the story, uh, the way the story goes is that we said, what if we have a database, okay? The database is the God. It knows if something is used or not. And if we somehow keep that database completely accurate all the time, then we can go and ask the database, hey, I want to use this channel. Is it being used or not? The database says no, then I go ahead and use it. So problem solved. Now the whole problem becomes in keeping the database accurate. Okay, so we actually wrote this paper about uh, database driven white space network and it sort of goes into a lot of detail if you want to go in there in terms of how you design the database, you know, what all it needs to have. And I'm going to say a few words about it, but I wanted to tell you. So that was the database approach. So Devices only use the channel specified by the database. Yes. But somewhere there has to be sensing done, no? even if you have a database. Uh, yeah. So no, the way it works is, um, uh, just one second. Yeah. The way it works is that the FCC takes the responsibility, in this approach, the FCC takes the responsibility of saying, we will own the master database. So that means if you have, let's say you were doing analog TV transmissions, and I'm FCC, you have to tell me that you're doing transmissions. Now, if you are, then I'll put it in my database, and all the other commercial vendors will build, uh, the actual database will be built by the commercial vendors, but they will take the feed off of me. So I am the most, I'm the responsible person, and then you have, you have responsibility towards me. And the commercial guys don't have any responsibility. They just have responsibility on my database, right? But, so that's, that's the way it works, so no sensing required. But you have to prove to me that you're actually transmitting, right? Because I mean, if you're if you're just saying that I'm transmitting and you're not, that's illegal. I'm going to you know find you, and so you have to. That means keep the transmission going. Now, for you to keep the transmission going, there has to be some commercial reason for you to do it, right? Why are you actually doing it? There's nobody using it. So I mean, the system is built like that right now, but it makes technology easy because now you can build a system without requiring sensing. Yeah. So the way policing works in all of this is that. It doesn't exist, but when it happens and you do it, you're gone forever. <laughs> so I mean, that's how FCC works. I mean, you could, like I could do and transmit whatever heck I could. Nobody, nobody no government official, nobody will know it. But if, and so the way they do it in the US is they will, uh, they will actually have, they have vans equipped with most sophisticated equipment and they just drive around and they, you never know where they are. And if they find some illegal stuff going on, they will sh not only shut you down, they will fine you and they will put you away. It's a crim criminal offense to do it. So it's done with, uh, with that sort of a heavy hand. But most of the time, you, can't, you can get away with it. Right? So uh, I'm just, I'm going to make it, I can make a joke about India, but I will not make it. <laughs> I'm an Indian too. But anyway, so, uh, so uh, that's how it works. All right. Yes. So what level of currency and accuracy did you maintain in your data? Like how current it was? Yeah. Right, so the question is, uh, so uh, the, you have to sort of speak from an entity perspective. So uh, the FCC may have some regulations with the, uh, with the guy who's transmitting that you have to update me so frequently, but the FCC mandates that once every 24 hours you have to check with me. So if you're a commercial user, you check with me every 24 hours, and I, don't, I say it's open, then you're okay. On the whatever the channels that you're looking at, the channels, I mean, they are specified. The channel is very, I mean, the, the band is specified. This is only for white spaces, by the way. This is not for the entire frequency. Uh, so, so, the database is only responsible for the time and frequency, or is there any other technology for the database? Just the channels. Channels are 6 megahertz from, uh, from one point to another, and says there are some numbers, let's say channel 22, from this band to this band is used, not used. That's how it's responsible. Correct, but great point, good question. And the reason I uh, say good, uh, great point, good question is because commercial vendors uh, commercial can, uh, can actually get that additional pieces of information such as what is, like, who is transmitting, what power levels they are transmitting at. And, and, I, and as you get deeper into it, you will realize that there are different rules for 
uh, channel. So for example, in, a, in a certain 6 megahertz, if there's no transmission going on in the contiguous channels, on the side channels, then you can transmit at a certain power level. But if there's some transmission going on in the contiguous, you can. So now the question is, uh, even though you might find a channel is free, you don't, you know, you could, you could sort of say, well, there, there is a, somebody is trying to occupy, but it's not really occupied. So maybe I can do some propagation modeling to say whether if I'm here, which is like two miles away from, from where the, uh, from, uh, you know, where the actual transmitter is, maybe I can use a second channel too without transmitting. So I guess uh, not to complicate the answer, the, the, uh, the question you ask and the answer is that the FCC doesn't, care about the transmission. It just says yes, no, that's all. But the commercial vendors can provide additional information to me, for you, the client, to do better, to be able to utilize. And that's where a lot of the great engineering can happen. And, and I'll show you some examples of that. So it's actually a decent, decent question to ask because that's how you build. But commercial vendors need to do some kind of, uh, they have to know what, what power level. Yeah, and that is available. It's just that FCC doesn't actually, it, it makes it available, but it's not going to uh, make any, not going to say anything about it. It just say yes or no. Yeah. Correct. You need, yeah. Yeah, so that's, so the, so the answer there is, hey, party, it's like Wi-Fi. <laughs> It's like you got, you got like 35 people, go do, you, do whatever you want to do. They don't care. So you can have as many secondaries. And so I think the way you deal with that is you design a Mac, right? It was channel sensing, listen before transmits, CSMA, that kind of thing. So, but we can talk about that too. This is actually a reasonable question as well. I have to, uh, let me think. Uh, we started at 10, right? So, okay. So I'm going to speed up just a little bit. So database maintains up-to-date uh, uh, list of protected channels. The database can block. Uh, and so, so this last bullet is kind of like, is an interesting bullet because if you think about it, if I'm going to always trans, uh, if I'm going to always consult the database, then the database actually has a lot of power in what it can do, right? It can sort of uh, arbitrarily control who can use or not, even if there's nobody using. So think of it as a channel access protocol. We'll get back to that in a few minutes. So pictorially, FCC, F, beautiful sign, F, C, C, L. Uh, some acronyms, you don't really care. Um, they provide it to the commercial data, the, uh, commercial, commercial uh, entities. They will then provide database all over in an original manner. All over, now, there's no reason, for example, if you're in Bangalore to figure out what's transmitting in Delhi. I mean, who cares, right? If you're, and you can, also, uh, uh, you can also sort of argue that if you and I see you know, you probably need only nearby, you don't really need. So you can have regional databases and to, uh, they, they provide the service of being consistent. They provide additional services that I'm going to talk about in a few seconds, a few minutes. Uh, but you, they are centrally driven by the FCC. And so these, they provide channel maps. <clears throat> then you can sort of consult with these channel maps and you can have transmission going on in those maps. That's how kind of it works, the system works. Now, Microsoft Research, way before any of this became uh, a commercial success or you know commercial at all we um, you know I showed you the paper that we tried. the paper was based on this database system that we built actually you might appreciate this the person who literally built the code for it is uh, Rohan Murthy anybody know Rohan Murthy all of the papers <laughs> he's not a bad guy I don't know what the papers say <laughs> they went to he says a good guy okay well he himself is not and I know there's all these issues and we can talk about it he was my in turn too, I was on his PhD thesis committee. I've known him for many years, and he um, he's, a, he's a reasonable guy. So anyway, so he uh, he can code. If nothing else, if you don't appreciate anything about it, the guy can code. He can go. He's been coding for a young, very young age, and he coded this thing up, and it, it works beautifully. His code was actually very good, and that was surprising to me because um, you know uh, it was very robust. So. So we had built this database and we provided it to, uh, to the world to use. And so um, really quickly, I mean, you can actually, if you, are, if you are interested, write to me. I'll send you the link to where it is. You can play with it. And it actually, uh, it is now been ported to Singapore and other uh, UK and other places as well. What, sh what you see here is a channel map. The reds are the ones which say that these are the ones that are being used. The yellows are the whites are the ones that are available. You can actually get, uh, the question that was asked is, you can get what kind of uh, what is happening in a particular channel. You know, this is the call signs. You can't read it well. I, I realize that, but these are call signs for 
like Como TV, uh, KMT, YQ, these are like local TV channels. There's the channel number, they're allocating what is the signal strength, right? What is the transmit power? Uh, what is the uh, the H mat, which has to do with the height of the transmitter and where it is, how far they are from elevation. So you can get all this information, okay? And then from there you can do your propagation modeling, and I'll tell you about that. And, it, and here it tells you where the base stations are located. You click on it, it tells you more information. So this is a database that gives you a lot more information than the FCC database is. And we provided this. We, we built our own system based on this, and then we provided the world to, to basically for researchers to do whatever they wanted to do with it. It was. Um, uh, no reason to repeat all that stuff. Okay, now, and it was—it's a really good database. Even to this day, this was done uh, five years ago, and to, uh, and even now, it is probably the best database out there. And the reason is because we went to great lengths in trying to uh, do the propagation modeling. So uh, the way to think about this is the following: if you if you say that there's a transmission going on in point A, and you know whether you're going to see a signal, so you create the database. You're two miles away. And it says it's busy. But you say, hey, I'm two miles away. Is it going to matter whether I transmit to that guy? Right? So you want to know what the propagation modeling is. So if you do free space loss, so this is on the on the horizontal axis, the fraction of the white space is lost. Okay? And this is just a CDF of that. And so if you're on this side, you're bad in some sense. Think of it that way. So because the number is higher, right? So this is free space loss. So if you just take a regular uh, uh, free space loss uh, modeling, this is what you get, right? This is what we were able to achieve. And this is done with using some terrain modeling. So we got, uh, we got this thing from NASA, actually. How does the terrain look like? We did some fancy um, uh, Longley-Rice modeling, changed some parameters here and there. And then we put it all together. And then we measured it in 1,000 different sites. So Rohan, who I mentioned, in a, sat in a car with a spectrum analyzer and drove about 1,000 miles around that and measured the data and measured it with the theoretical thing that we had come up with to see how good it was. And uh, in fact, he was actually stopped by a cop once because of that, you know, was, uh, they were running like, what is he doing? Is it a terrorist or something, like measuring things? <laughs> so he had to say, no, 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 I'm a researcher and I'm trying to do, I'm a student, blah, blah, blah. So I hope this answers the question that you asked, which is that, that uh, a good database provider will not just say yes or no, but will actually provide you some more information and uh, that's the value add that the database is providing. Because now, you as a client, they're still not going to take the responsibility. They will still tell you no, but here's what it looks like. And you can make the judgment that, hey, I really need to transmit. I'm two and a half miles away from it. I'm not going to get any signals you know, from the other thing. I'm going to transmit, right? And most likely, you'll be fine. There'll be nobody complaining, and you'll be fine. So, so that's what uh, uh, some of these database vendors are doing. But that's where sort of some of the engineering and the communication theory that you've studied and the antenna stuff and all that can come into being. You can actually make this better and better. And there are people who have actually written papers after this. I just wanted to show you the seminal papers, and then you can look at the papers afterwards. So where I lived, we also asked the question, is it actually available? Like, how many people are transmitting? So this is where, right, this is where Microsoft's headquarters is. This is where I live. This is Seattle, Samaritan, New York, Boston, all that stuff. This is the number of channels that are available. This is approximately bandwidth available. If you do some rule of thumb, some, so many bits per hertz. I forget what I did here. You can just do the math. You'll find out. Then you can say, this is the kind of capacity you can actually get. OK? And uh, then um, this is your thing. You can always make the cell size smaller. There's nothing preventing you from doing that. So if, if there's, in fact, uh, I don't have a picture of that. Uh, if you think about the mesh world, um, the way we sort of thought about mesh was with dual frequency meshes. You've got, when you have less density of population, you can have these uh, cell sizes very, being very large. And as it becomes popular, you can just keep adding more cell size and this change the transmit power and increase the, and so you can actually create uh, uh, multi-frequency mesh networks. OK, so this is uh, just a pretty picture to show that, and you don't have to worry about the details here. The point is that if you write software, you have to think logically about how am I going to write this software, right? Because I've suddenly introduced a database angle. I, this is not like Wi-Fi anymore. It's not about sensing. Right now, if you think about the difference between Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi is just in the radio itself, there's a sensing protocol, right, which is the CSMA. It senses it, and it transmits. And that, I think that, um, Sachin gave you a talk about full duplex and things like that. So essentially, that's what they were trying to overcome, which is they were just doing it in the radio. But now we've introduced a completely different thing. We've sort of added a database entity, and um, you still have to be compliant. So we've got to change the stack a little bit. So this picture, just is, like I said, is a pretty picture. It sort of allows you to 
think modularly about this whole system about how you're going to build the software. You're going to have these different things, and so you just do that. So don't worry too much about it. It's just that architecturally you have to think differently. So we, you know, remember I said that there are a lot of people talking about it, but somebody has to build it. So we actually built the thing. We built the whole network. These are some pictures from that deployment. There were some buildings. We put up some antennas. Uh, there's white space antennas. These are some TV antennas, and we put them deliberately close to that because we got uh, the local TV guy got very upset with us, saying that we were messing around. And we actually invited them and showed them their TV transmission and showed them white space transmission simultaneously to prove to them that nothing bad is going to happen because we have the technology to do it. And then they signed off on it, and that helped uh, further. This is a shuttle. We, inside the shuttle, you see a laptop, you see a radio, and the shuttle was driving around. We were providing uh, Wi-Fi uh, uh, wi access to the corporate network because from a laptop, you can connect to this little box through Wi-Fi. And then from, uh, from here, we would connect from white spaces into the building. And it just drove it. This is the shuttle guy putting it in. This is the shuttle. The antenna at that time kind of looked very cumbersome. So here's the antenna. That's our shuttle. And so after we had built all this stuff, we invited the FCC chairman to, because there was a lot of debate. And we showed him. So this is me right here. This is at the CTO at the time. Here's a researcher who worked with Ranveer Thomas. This is the chairman of the FCC, right? This is the guy who reports to the President of the United States. He's a pretty serious guy. And this is, we are sitting in the shuttle. We drove him around. We showed him the whole thing working. We actually showed video demonstrating. And so he was, they were so impressed. I believe, and this is obviously, I cannot prove it unless you, somebody talks to him directly. But I believe that after he'd seen it, and he, he, I spent two hours that day presenting to him in a room, small room, him and his uh, two other people. And he asked me tons of questions. He went back convinced that you could build this technology, the opportunistic technology. And so they opened it up. 180 megahertz of spectrum was opened up for use for unlicensed in the United States. It was a big success for us. So let me show you a little video here. Yeah, it's OK. This is some marketing thing, but never goes. With the ongoing transition from analog to digital TV, more and more spectrum is opening up. Adaptive radio technologies allow networks to have the advantages of inexpensive Wi-Fi and the long range of cellular. These technologies can help us use that spectrum by dynamically finding and using the white spaces between frequencies used by existing broadcasters and wireless microphones. This allows more users to coexist on the spectrum. Microsoft researchers have been exploring this challenge for many years and have created a network that finds and uses these white spaces. This technology uses your location and information from nearby transmitters to determine what frequencies are available, then dynamically moves to the frequencies for use in those white spaces. Technology like this can offer low-cost connectivity for underserved communities, schools, or hospitals. By ensuring that this spectrum is available for unlicensed use around the world, government policymakers can help innovators find even more uses for this bandwidth and preserve the economic and social value of this important resource. OK, so this is pretty much what I said. So now, um, <clears throat> the world we started with was looked like this. So on the horizontal axis is the range. On the vertical axis is the speed. So Wi-Fi sits somewhere around here, OK? So that's about 100, 200, 250 meters. And then can go from whatever, 100 to 600 megabits have also been demonstrated. So that's where Wi-Fi is, USB, Bluetooth, Zigbee things. What I've been talking about is sits here. All right, so the range is higher, the bandwidth is less. Now, as you sort of mentally think about what you can do with this, this starts to give you some idea of, of this is actually a different technology. This is actually opens up new opportunities, both commercials as well as availability. So we talked a lot about this. I mean, this, these are scenarios. Uh, if you heard, like, for example, in Microsoft, I just show you some pictures of a network we are building with Kun. Uh, like if you're in Microsoft uh, Redmond, it's a huge uh, space, uh, not unlike this university, and uh, lots of buildings. So you can provide campus-wide coverage everywhere. And so you it walk around. You can provide that. You can provide security, uh, security network, which I'm building now. Giant hotspots. Right, you can have a, a access point, and then a mile and a half, mile approximately, you can connect to it. Content distribution networks, you can provide direct connectivity to retail portals, all, and you can just you know, basically all the wireless stuff you can do in the cell space. You can do here. Lots of regulation body, regulatory bodies all over the world came and saw that whole thing, 
and they're going ahead and, and, and building. I think we had people from India as well as come up. I don't know if I have. Yeah, I do. Uh, they came in 2009 to sort of figure out. So they were going to see, do the same thing in there because this problem is true everywhere in the world. It's not the US. Uh, this is Rohan Murthy that I talked about. He got his PhD thesis out of this. There was another uh, person that I uh, supervised. She got a PhD thesis out of it, and there's some more that are going on. So there's many, many problems. I'll, I'll get into that in the next lecture, for example. And so what we've also done is we've demonstrated or de deployed a lot of these pilots all over the world, in Africa especially. Um, there's actually two bullets, but there are more uh, different parts of the world to demonstrate because everybody wants to see this thing actually works. Uh, these are some pictures in there and that. Uh, so one of our biggest trials was in Cambridge, England, and this involved a lot of different people from different uh, um, uh, vendors, uh, uh, you know, database providers, different um, hardware providers, etc., and uh, using 14 UHF channels. And this was built up and deployed in the UK, and uh, it all worked and succeeded. It was successful at it. Uh, in Kenya, we deployed this in a very rural setting, okay. And uh, it worked. And this is something that I got completely unsolicited, of course. And I want you to read it just for a second. I'll be quiet as you read it. Now, the reason I wanted you to read it is because I don't know about how you feel. I don't know how things are here. I mean, I do know a little bit about things are. I do know everybody talks about these big things like uh, WhatsApp being bought for $13 billion and whatever, startup, I'll do a startup, I'll do this, right? And very few people, I feel like it's our obligation to sort of say that there is stuff that you do which really impacts human life. They really impacts. Now, this individual, for example, you know, he's sort of thinking like he had no clue, didn't know what the world was doing, and suddenly you had, he had this ability to see the world. That's, that has to amount for something. So even as you build these technologies, even as you learn a lot of stuff in the books and things, and, but the application of it in the real world is providing things that nobody else have ever seen. That's a really good thing. And that should be a pretty big driving force in some of your lives, I think. Uh, because if nothing else, uh, you know, when you look back at your life, you'll say, I had an impact, um, you know, which was substantial. OK, uh, this is just a little picture of, of different countries, United States, UK, Finland, Canada, blah, blah, blah talks about uh, what is happening. For example, in the US, uh, law has been passed, regulations have been passed, policy guidance have been provided, trials are being completed. So it's pretty good. In the UK, also in Cambridge, because of the trials we're showing, you know, this is happening. So it's happening. Now, it is important in the world to do all this stuff because nobody's going to build product unless, or, you know, products usually get built if they're applicable all over the world. And so it's kind of important to make sure that it, it's harmonized all over the, uh, the world. Uh, there are lots of other things going on. So, for example, the IEEE standards has, has a thing called AF, which is the wireless LAN standard for TV band channelization. And uh, standards are very important because standards bring the price down, right? Because now they commoditize the hardware. And once, I mean, Wi-Fi, uh, I was working on it in 89. This used to cost about three, $400 per, uh, per uh, NIC, $400 per NIC, which was a lot of money at that time, which is equal to, I would imagine, $1,000 at least now, maybe more. Uh, for every NIC, and now it's like $5, or less than $5, right? It just comes back because standardization happened, and then when standardization happens, the cost went down. So when you see things now in white spaces and they're costly, that's only because you're at the front end, right? But that means if, you, if you're still working on it, you could be the ones who actually have profit out of all this stuff because standardization has happened. So there's standardization happening all over the world, and you can follow all this stuff. Uh, I suspect you'll have these slides so you can look it up. And then uh, in terms of the databases that I talked about, um, the databases had to go to the FCC. They went and get certified, so they get a FCC certification. Um, and uh, once they, so there are several companies, including Google, which has gone uh, and certified the database. So they provide these databases to anybody to use for free. But you have to work with a certified database to be able to use. So this is this picture. This is just a snapshot saying that's happening. And then um, similarly, devices have to be certified. So for example, every uh, NIC that you have is a certified piece of uh, hardware, which, is that it, uh, which says that it is actually complying to whatever the FCC has said. Now, th so, uh, FCC has, this is sort of a unique problem for FCC now, because initially, if you bought a piece of hardware, they would take it into their test thing and would test it. But now, you have to have a combination of that hardware and the database for the network to be operated. So, so for them to certify it, you know, they've had to redesign the certification process to think about how will they certify that 
radio is compliant to everything that the FCC is saying, and then they, uh, but you still can't use it unless you have a certified database. But anyway, the point here is that there are companies that are now starting to provide hardware. Now, again, there's an opportunity if you do want to do a startup, if you do want to, if you do want to think about that, you could potentially build these things, right? You could actually because they're all these early startups, they cost a lot of money. Uh, for us to deploy, we have to spend a lot of money. But you know, you, uh, if you, you're, a lot of your electrical engineers, you should be able to design this. And I'll show you a design uh, later on, which is pretty simple and straightforward. So in terms of us, I told you that we had built that thing. And uh, then we took a little bit of a break from that. Uh, several people kept doing. Kun is going to give you a talk in the next couple of days, I think, on uh, a software-defined radio. So we're actually using Kun's uh, hardware and software into the next generation of the network that we are building now. So we're deploying this. Um, this is a specification of the other system that we're deploying. Now, you could deploy it in your campuses as well. Uh, that would be, you know, if, you, if you're going to go to grad school, if you're even doing a senior project, there's no reason why you couldn't do something like this. But we are deploying this with a voice over IP support. Now we want to build a production quality system that's got a camera feed coming. So you've got, uh, you know, and then we are also going to uh, do some interesting visual analytics on it. I'll mention this to you. Uh, uh, tomorrow when I talk about uh, a different topic about what we're doing. And then the equipment we're using is Sora, which I mentioned. Soon is going to talk about it. That should be an interesting talk. Uh, it's all, all completely software-defined radio. And uh, this is not certified. The reason we wanted to use a software-defined radio is because we wanted to control every aspect of the stack from, from both the hardware to the software to every little thing because we are researchers and we want to be able to tweak every different thing and come up with the best network we possibly can. Right. So. If you're, if you're going to do any research, you need a platform like that. You need something very flexible. If you're going to commercial, then you actually can uh, see, learn from this and s decide like what is the best uh, commercial entity, a uh, commercial product I can build from that. And we use uh, Rice University. Oh, that talk is happening also. And now we have students uh, of theirs. Uh, Clay, who's, who was here with me last semester, he's coming here again this semester, who's uh, continuing to deploy this. Um, and he works with Ashu, and this is a beautiful platform as well. And then they have a commercial platform as well. So what we're doing is, uh, this is sort of an aerial, uh, aerial picture. I can't even say there's some soccer field. This is where our building is. This is where I sit. Somewhere in here are the base stations. I don't know what that's. OK, so then um, one, one research problem we are solving is uh, that of uh, interference mitigation. So for example, if you have uh, uh, base stations running, and they're, uh, they're just you know, uh, sending their traffic, they're going to interfere. Especially for long range a wireless network, that becomes a bigger problem because it's an omnidirectional thing and it's going all over the place. That's no good because if these things become popular, you're going to interfere. We don't want that. So what we want to do is this. So we want to build directional systems that, that can adapt themselves to wherever they are pushing the data. And uh, we, uh, to then we can mitigate uh, some of this interference. Now, this is part of ongoing research. So what I'm showing you now is the state of art. This has not been built yet. It, you know, in theory, we know how to build it. It's been done in other frequencies, but not in UHF frequencies. And there are issues with the UHF frequencies, such as the antenna size. And modulation uh, theory teaches you that the antenna size is directly or is proportional to, to the frequencies in which you operate on, or uh, inversely proportionally. So, um, so we're building this thing. And, and so as you know, uh, over the next uh, hour when I talk about it, you will start to see the technical problems, which is what you really, I think, care about. I just want to give you the whole thing. This is what our picture looks like. That's a Sora board. You'll hear a lot more about this. Uh, and I focused on Sora, but we have the warp thing. Actually, warp is uh, nicer in some respect because it's uh, smaller. And so it allows us to build client stuff. So in Sora, what we're doing is right now, we're building base stations from Sora. And we're building clients using the warp board. And uh, the, our, the thing that we have ne nobody has ever done is to show the interoperability between the two software-defined radios. And that's a lot of engineering, a lot of hard work. But, but we've uh, gotten there. We can actually uh, see Sora and Warp talk to one another, which is very, very cool. But Sora in itself uh, is not enough. Then there's a the front end, which I don't know if you're going to talk about or not. Oh, you've already, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> OK. Reverse. OK, he's already finished the talk. So Kun has already done all this stuff. So that's cool. OK, so you know uh, a little bit about this. This is the pictures, again. That's the company which brings the uh, uh, front end, uh, and this is the adapter <coughs> stuff. This is Clay. He's just, uh, there's some you know, work. These are students. I just wanted to show you. They show you they're just like you in the US. He's climbing ladders, putting things up, putting the antenna. Nobody does it. Everybody has to do their own. This is a board that was built. We put it into a weather-resistant thing so that if rain, shine, whatever, it can still work. 
That's the building I work in. Uh, you can't actually see, there, you can't really see this, but there's an antenna, there's a bunch of antennas that, that are sitting on top of that building. Um, that's the guy, Clay, this is uh, some pictures. Those are the antennas, a closer view. There are many, many antennas here. And people actually, the uh, people in the offices here got worried and started sending me mail saying, hey, you're frying my brain. It's actually not that. We actually have a lot of these antennas because we're trying different things, right? We're trying different aspects of the, uh, of the, of the directionality that I talked about. So we had, to, uh, we had to try different antenna uh, st styles. And this is what I mean by saying that, uh, you know, it's good to do theory, but uh, I am, I'm a big advocate of actually building these systems up because what you learn from that is, after all, theory is an observation of the practical stuff, right? So it's, you can't act, theory can only try to explain what you're doing in some sense, and then you learn where it lacks. And so when you build all these things up, then you start to see. This is the soccer field. This is uh, where uh, th there's a box here which has the SORA board. There's a little antenna. There's a camera that is pointing here down. You can't, oh, there we go. There's a cam camera there. And so whenever there's a game, this thing lights up, and then we transmit that uh, to the rest. Now, Wi-Fi couldn't have done it because this uh, soccer field is pretty far away from the building. And then this is the solar antenna. So we're also, also trying to make it self-sustaining. So if you want to go into rural areas and you don't have electricity, that's what you need. And so we've, we've got systems where we're looking at the end. You know, Seattle is, or Redmond is not a great area because it rains and it's very clouded. But we're trying to make sure that we have enough energy coming in that these systems can run without actually having power. Uh, some more picture. This is a client. This is the WAP board. This is in a little container. just wanted to show you that, too. And this can, uh, right now, it's pretty big. And that's where the commercial opportunity exists to sort of to take this and shrink it to the point where it can actually put it in your laptop. If you could make it in a USB form factor, you're going to make a lot of money, without a question. And you could have startups in that field. Um, and uh, so right now, this is our client. And we kind of put it in wherever we want to put it to make sure that it works uh, well. This is one of the antennas here. Uh, this is some boxes, some more pictures. Uh, from oh, this is a yeah a picture just showing this is antenna and that little person right th that little box is where, where I think Gun was sitting there and uh, Yang Wang was sitting there, yeah. Uh, there's a little van here somewhere. Uh, I'm sure, yeah, where is it? The red car. There. Okay, whatever. Red SUV. Okay, fine. And oh yeah, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Right there, the two of them is Yong Hong, Yong Hong, uh, who's a colleague of Kun, and Kun is sitting there, which is like really far away. This is the building, and uh, they were, they had to buy. Just, I'm just showing you these pictures so you know, like what it takes to do uh, research. Okay, uh, this is a gas tank with petrol in it. Okay, because we didn't have enough battery power to do. This is this is actually. This is a motor which runs the thing to give it enough battery juice for it to actually transmit. So, you know, this is the kind of uh, systems we sort of, and of course, at the end we get this. So it's kind of grainy here, but it's a Skype call. So I'm making a Skype call to him. And I mean, it's much better than this. I just did a sort of, the, here, this is me sitting here. This one right there. This is another guy who works with me. And this is Yang Wang sitting there and saying, hey, victory, we got it working. So that's all. So um, I'll stop here. Um, I will uh, give you a break, a five minute break. There's a video, I'll start with this in the next talk, and then we get into a little, some technical meat. But uh, if you have any questions, I'm fr you're free to ask, but I want to give you a five minute break. And then we'll start promptly, whatever five minutes at three, uh, 15, 11.15. Are there any plans to move to other banks? Or yeah, so I'll talk about that.